Good afternoon, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to the uh, Royal Society of Edinburgh and Scottish Consortium for Rural Research, Peter Wilson Lecture. And for those of you who would like to pin uh, either Jill or Yvonne, these are our interpreters for this afternoon. So that's either Jill or Yvonne, who are our interpreters for this afternoon, and we're delighted to have them with us. So I'm really happy to welcome you both as Director of Programmes here at the Royal Society of Edinburgh and as Scientific Director for the Scottish Consortium for Rural Research. The uh, SCRR Peter Wilson Lecture was created in memory of the distinguished agriculturalist and former RSE General Secretary, Professor Peter Wilson, CBE. The annual lecture is now a joint event between SCRR and the RSE. And we're really thrilled that David Wilson, Peter Wilson's son, is online with us today. So hello, David. Both the RSE and the SCRR share the mission of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, which is knowledge made useful for public good across the whole of Scotland. Both societies have a rich history with the RSE established in 1783, and the SCRR born much, much later in 1947, originally as the Edinburgh Centre for Rural Economy. As well as being a partnership between the RSE and SCRR, this year's event also reflects the RSE's partnership work around climate change with the Royal Scottish Geographical Society, the James Hutton Institute, Scottish Natural Heritage, Young Scott and Scottish Enterprise. And I'll be coming back to that just very briefly at the end of our event today. But we're particularly excited by this year's event because it brings together really inspiring young speakers from across the world, from diverse backgrounds, who are challenging us with their thoughts on how we can and should work together with new evidence in our collective response to rural climate change. So now, we're going to hear from these great speakers via their pre-recorded videos, and then we'll see you, I'll see you all again in about half an hour with the panelists. And just at this point, I'd like to thank Steve Wilson and Nazia Khan, who you won't see, but they've been behind the scenes and are behind the scenes in making sure this all works. So Steve is now going to magically make the uh, videos work for the next half an hour and then we'll pick up again for the live debate. Many thanks. Hello from Vietnam. My name is Le Hong Ngoc. I am researchers from Institute of Human Geography. Our institute is a member unit of Vietnam Academy of Social Science. As a governmental organization, our institute specialized in human geography, climate change, environment, and sustainable development. I am going to tell you about how we as young researchers from the institute are contributing to the research of climate change and rural communities in Vietnam. Rural residents has been accounting for more than 65% of the total Vietnamese populations for the last three decades. Rural communities are targeted as one of the most vulnerable groups to climate change in Vietnam. Due to limitation in nature, humans, physical, financials, and social capitals, rural residents are exposed to many risks and injuries in terms of not only health and well-being, but also livelihoods. We have been conducting more than 60 scientific works with the focus on livelihoods and climate change in Vietnamese rural community. It is clear that agriculture, forestry, and aquaculture still remain as main ways of living for the poor, minor ethnic, and rural residents in Vietnam. This sector accounts for 20% of the national GDP annually and it also plays as a source for food security and input for other sectors. However, Vietnamese agriculture, 
Forestry and aquaculture still rely heavily on nature according to its book. This increases the exposure of rural livelihoods as well as rural communities to external shocks such as climate change. Common impacts include loss of agricultural land and productivity due to changes in temperature and rainfall, natural disaster and extreme weather phenomena. In general, what we do is to examine the status of rural livelihoods under impacts of environmental change and natural hazard to highlight opportunity and threats for vulnerable communities and to propose recommendations for policy makers in terms of response to climate change in rural Vietnam. Besides, our topics vary from adaptive livelihoods in coastal areas, active response in the dentals, sustainable agriculture in mountainous regions and environmental management in the wetlands. Our latest project titled Sustainable Livelihood for Climate Change Adaptation of Rural Communities in the South Central Coast of Vietnam has been conducting for two years with the funding from Vietnam's National Foundation for Science and Technology Development. We investigate how conventional livelihoods of rural communities in the coastal area, which are cultivation, agriculture, and tourism, are affected by sea level rise saltwater intrusion and drought. We approach the issues from a human ecological approach with the aim to harmonize natural and social economic subsystem of the rural communities under so many pressures of development and climate change. The outcome of our work is theoretical arguments and practical evidence for Vietnamese government and ministry to design and execute strategies, mechanisms, and policies on climate change and climate change response. We also publish national and international papers on climate change and sustainable development to contribute to academic platforms so that scholars and researchers can apply mutual exchange and learning knowledge. That is all that I want to share with you about our work on climate change and rural communities in Vietnam. If you are interested in what we do, you can access to our website or library for more details on our work. Thank you for your listening. Oh, hang on. Hold it there. Can I get the interpreter's attention, please? I need a voiceover. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Maybe you struggled to understand what I was saying. Yeah, this is how deaf people struggle every day. They miss that vital information. They don't have access to BSL or captions. So let me go back and start again. So hi, my name is Alison Hendry. And I'm currently employed as the BSL Development Officer at the University of Edinburgh. I'm so excited to be here today, so thank you so much for the invitation to speak. So what is BSL British Sign Language? Well, it is a language in its own right. It has its own syntax and grammatical structure and its own vocabulary, of course. And it's been around for many, many years, but was only recognised as an official language back in 2003. Throughout Scotland, we anticipate we have around 12,500 BSL users. And from that number, we have around 7,200 who are themselves deaf. Of course, we have the BSL Scotland Act now, 2015. And within that, it puts a responsibility duty on public bodies to ensure that their services are accessible for the deaf BSL using community. So that could be access to health information, for example, or for education, or for various areas in life. So it means that we want to ensure that there is accessible language there for them. 
for many years, we know that deaf people have suffered barriers and they've had to try and overcome these. And that means that one of the things is it's, uh, there's no access to information. We know that information is readily available in English, but we don't have it available in BSL. So BSL is the first and preferred language of the sign language community, of the BSL community. And of course, it can be difficult to understand English because of the jargon that's within it. If it's in BSL, of course, though, they fully understand the explanation. Deaf people themselves have, you know, knowledge and understanding in the same way as the hearing community do. They understand and suffer from mental health, for example, so they need access to that information. But they do have skills and experience, but they just don't have the opportunity to be provided that information in their own preferred language. They need a translation. So I'll give you an example um, of getting access to important information. We are struggling at the moment with coronavirus throughout the world, of course. And you may have been aware you know, of some of the information that's been available to know what to do, the regulations you'd follow. And in Scotland especially, the First Minister has had an interpreter with her daily, as you can see here. So that has been vitally important for the deaf BSL community. It means they're aware of their, their the, the regulations, they can understand the information, they know that they need to stay home, they need to keep socially distant, two metres apart, because obviously it's really important for health. The UK government, on the other hand, haven't followed um, that trailblazing of the Scottish government, but that's another story. We're here to talk about climate change today. And in honesty, I did have a look at the website and I couldn't find a lot of information online about climate change in BSL. So I'm not surprised a lot of young people struggle with lack of information. There is a person I know well um, called Erin. She is herself deaf. She's a sign language user. And she is involved in the Scottish Youth Parliament. She's always been a keen activist in terms of making sure that information is available in her language. And I know that she was on Twitter recently um, with a complaint to a local authority because there'd been an event on climate change and it was going to be live streamed. And unfortunately, the local authority hadn't provided a BSL interpreter. This is what she said. So you can see the impact that has on that missing information. There is no parity there. So we know that deaf kids, for example, go to mainstream schools now, but there is no access to, or limited access to BSL when we follow the curriculum for excellence. And of course, there are various topics that that follows, one being climate change, but the resources are limited in BSL. So it's vitally important that any information that's provided is also provided in British Sign Language. And obviously you could may have noticed with me working today that it's a very visual language. So it's something to consider to put in maybe more visual, visuals there so that people readily understand what is getting said. It might well be that you put in other examples to the past, what's happening now, or what may happen in the future. And that adds that emphasis and information. So it's something to consider as you move forward. Whether it's face-to-face -face or an online event like this, please consider booking a BSL interpreter so that deaf people can be fully engaged and contribute to the discussion. And obviously, if there's any important information, please try and make it readily available in BSL by using short clips, for example. And it would be good to have a young person involved as well, just so that they're able to express it in their own language. Again, just to reiterate, create some nice visuals, ensuring that it can be read, readily accessed. And that always works best. Thank you so much for watching. Bye. Hi, my name is Christy Drutman and I'm the founder and media creator of my own podcast and media series called Brown Girl Green, where I interview environmental leaders and advocates about why diversity and inclusion is important in the environmental movement, as well as creative solutions to the climate crisis. 
I'm sure all of you are very concerned about the pandemic happening right now, but also about the bigger long-term threat of the climate crisis and figuring out how we can continue to get people to take action when we can't organize them in person. An important way to do this from my own experience as both a digital media strategist and a content creator is through social media. According to Data Reportal, there are currently 3.81 billion social media users around the world. That's nearly 49% of the entire world's population. The average user has around eight social media accounts across platforms and spends around two and a half hours using social media every day. That means we have an exponential amount of opportunities to engage people on the climate crisis using social media platforms. And all of us, climate scientists, policymakers, and activists have an opportunity to create the cultural shift necessary to get people to act on climate immediately. My favorite way to use social media is through storytelling. While the data and the technology to build a sustainable, clean energy future is alive and well and here, it is clear that we lack the cultural momentum necessary to actually make these things a reality. I believe that even though there was a huge spark from last year's global climate strikes, which began to bring the climate movement into more of the mainstream media, we still need to build the buzz. The issue that I find is that even with the amazing efforts of folks like Greta Thunberg, Naomi Klein, Jane Goodall, Bill McKimmon, and so forth, people who receive lots of media and press as the thought leaders of the climate movement, there are lots of voices and communities that don't receive the same kind of attention. And consequently, a lot of listeners and audiences who are not listening to the messages or the content of the climate movement at large because they can't relate to it. It doesn't have the same cultural nuance or connection that gets people to care. The global majority of people living on our planet right now are people who look like me. People with brown skin, brown eyes, and thick brown curly hair. They are black, they are brown, they are indigenous, they are children of immigrants, they are refugees we have to consider who is in the global majority when we're thinking about solutions to the climate crisis and who's not being given a seat at the table in these conversations. The reason why this is such a huge issue is because if we don't know people's names, we don't know their stories, and we don't feel connected to their lives. This can be scaled up to the environmental defenders around the world from countries in the global south who are being killed while protecting their land from extraction and mining. The Philippines, the country where my family is from, is now considered the deadliest country for environmental defenders in the world. There was up to 46 recorded deaths in 2019, making the Philippines ground zero for why we need to think about the climate crisis and how it's impacting communities at large. If we don't even know the names of these land defenders or their stories, who knows what other lives could be at stake. The same goes for small grassroots environmental justice organizations like Black Millennials for Flint, Communities for a Better Environment, the Asia Pacific Environmental Network, Kalikasan, and so forth, organizations that are largely operated and run by people of color, but who do not receive the same kind of attention, funding, or resources as bigger environmental organizations or institutions. These people are not just statistics or faces on a screen. They are symbols for what the climate movement needs to do to move forward. We need to be telling their stories as quickly as possible about the climate crisis and how it's impacting people's real lives every day. Because presenting their stories may be a matter between life or death. In order to increase the diversity and the inclusiveness of our movement, we must continuously fight to give diverse voices a platform as well as the resources necessary to push their ideas forward on how we can build a more sustainable world. This includes ensuring that people of color in particular are not just used as tokens for political ploys or for you know, even activist speeches, et cetera, that they are actually given the emotional, 
financial and physical support for their safety and their well-being in the battle against the climate crisis. And then there's people like me, young people of color who are actually taking climate media into their own hands by trying to reach new diverse audiences. We are emerging content creators that are combining science, policy, culture, and community into condensed, creative, and nuanced pieces of content that inspire, engage, and motivate people, particularly people of color, to take action on the climate crisis. Yet, a lot of us don't receive as much grant funding, support, or recognition from the wider mainstream media or the climate movement at large for that matter. Our work is sincerely grassroots and a labor of love to share the digital stories, the skills, and new thought leadership independent of mainstream institutions. I hope people will continue to acknowledge and support environmental media creators, especially those from diverse backgrounds, who are not just sitting around waiting for a cultural revolution on climate to occur. We are standing side by side, building it together every single day. Diversity is young, it is disabled, it is indigenous, it is elderly, it is black, it is brown, it is queer. Diversity is what makes up the fabric of our planet, and it's time we orate the stories of those who deserve a seat at the table who otherwise have been ignored. As we adapt to a changing climate, I hope everyone can use storytelling and media as tools to build intentional, innovative, and meaningful relationships with people around the world. People who don't look like you, people who don't think like you, and people who don't act like you. We need to embrace diversity as not just something tangential or accessory, but essential as an abundant asset that we need to tap into as a climate movement at large. We need to tap into diversity because it is our time to truly create stories that will touch the hearts and minds of our families, our friends, and our communities who may finally feel inspired and ready to join us in this beautiful fight for our lives. Hi everyone, my name is Holly Gillibrand. I'm a 14-year-old environmentalist, activist, and rewilding advocate, and I'm sitting here in my garden in Fort William. We are living through strange times, in more ways than one. The world has been shut down to protect people from a pandemic that arose from our reckless destruction of the natural world, and subsequently we have seen a mass realisation of what can be achieved if we put our minds to it. During my talk today, I will discuss three key points that I would like you to take away, because while the world is currently focused on coronavirus, the other crises, climate breakdown and ecological breakdown, have not gone away. Youth activists had a lot of plans for 2020, but because all crises must be treated as crises, we changed our plans. We instead found new ways of getting our message out there. So my first point is that the voice of my generation matters and we need to be heard. It is young people who have been leading the fight against environmental crises. While adults have shared responsibility, millions of children have been mobilizing around the world, which has resulted in a spike in environmental awareness among the general public and an increasing pressure on politicians to act. Something else that has struck me is that young people seem to have a unique ability to tell right from wrong and to see issues in black or white. Maybe this is because we are not burdened with vested interests and we don't have the same sense of societal pressures that adults have. It is also my generation that has the most at stake in the future and we therefore should be able to have a say in today's politics. So when you turn off your screens this evening, listen to what your children have to say and help them build a better world. We can't do this by ourselves and it is imperative that our voices are listened to. My second point is that we need a new environmental story. Facts alone will not wake people up. Facts do not inspire or motivate people in the same way that words and stories do. I used to be the sort of person who would spout endless figures and statistics in a speech, 
because I thought that that would get through to people. Until I realised that I was wrong. I became involved in the environmental movement, not after reading the IPCC report or the WWF Living Planet report, but by discovering other activists who are passionate about the same things I was. I joined the climate strikes after listening to a speech by Greta Thunberg and got involved in rewilding because rewilding is not about how to avoid a horrendous future, but how to make a better one. This paragraph from Rob Hopkins' book, From What Is to What If, reflects the power of storytelling to inspire hope and action. I dream that these 20 years, when the climate crisis, the collapse of the world's biodiversity, the unravelling of democracy and the multitude of other challenges converging on us, with great urgency have been slowed down and even turned around, the years when the great rebuilding is well underway will be the time of our lives. I dream that because imagination is at its heart, it will be a time of great music, great writing, great conversation, great art, great dancing. Our streets will fill with play and with the unexpected, with mime artists directing the traffic. Our lives will fill with everyday awe. When I read From What Is To What If, I was filled with hope, and that is an emotion many, many times more powerful than misery and despair. But as it is an emotion that does not come ready-made. To have hope, we need to act. Right now, we are so focused on where we are headed if we do not act, that we are forgetting to imagine what the world could be like if we did. The dream that Rob Hopkins wrote about doesn't need to remain a dream. We can achieve it. All we need is the will to do so. And I believe that stories can help play, pave the way. So moving on to my third point, what's next? Right now we are in the middle of a mass awakening and we have seen how quickly we can act in a crisis if we choose to. Countries have locked down within days, air pollution has dropped, wildlife is returning, people are replacing cars on the streets and communities have formed. To be clear, these are not the silver linings of COVID-19. Nothing can justify the suffering and death it has caused. However, for the first time, we have caught a glimpse of the future. We are realising, finally, that the normal we had was not normal and was causing the deaths of millions of people and animals. Instead of going back to what we had, we must use this opportunity to build a better world. A society where people are kind to one another, one that is just, fair and equal, a society where both people and planet are respected and protected, and we live in balance with the natural world. We could end this era of intense loneliness and be connected once more. So please use this time of confinement to reflect and imagine. We can only move towards a better future when we know what it looks like, and this may be one of our last chances. I hope you have been interested and inspired by my talk. Thank you very much for being here today and stay safe. Hello and welcome. Many thanks to the organisers for the invitation to present at this lecture. I'm grateful for the opportunity and look forward to exploring with you all. My name's Rachel Grant. I'm a freelance curator based in Aberdeen in the northeast of Scotland. In 2018, I developed a curatorial platform, Fertile Ground, and its focus is primarily on new commissions and works with people across backgrounds and disciplines. The presentation today will focus on the importance of arts and culture as we narrate the climate, climate futures and potential post-oil imaginaries. This, from the context of Aberdeen, uses the lens of oil. So the structure is twofold. The first, the reliable narrator, surrounds a current challenge in climate change debate, an example of the subject matter that makes up what Sheena Wilson calls the energy impasse, where oil's narration is that of reliability. The brief examples given attempt to disrupt this narrative at a local level. And two, climate change and pedagogy, uses an example of a project I was involved with this year, 
the Curatorial Fellowship. I want to offer it as a provocation for thinking through how young people could be supported further in the climate change debate. 1. The Reliable Narrator When you think of oil production in the North Sea, what do you see and how would you describe it? A technological feat, reliable, offshored, penetrating, distant, separate, stoic, clean, linear, job opportunities, hard work but a wholesome life, wealth for all. So what else do we need to talk about? For me, it's those narratives that are not as visible. There is a history of critique and protest in this city. Through this history, can we critique the position of oil as a reliable narrator? And if so, can it be made unreliable? The Oil Over Troubled Waters 1975 issue of Aberdeen People's Press situated a critique of how oil was transforming and changing the North East, both economically and socially. I also wanted to talk about Margaret Simpson and Old Tory. Old Tory was a place in Aberdeen that no longer exists. When oil first arrived, there was a need to make way for the industry. As the report states, one of the most historic places of Aberdeen, Old Tory, is to be bulldozed over to make way for the oil industry. Most of the houses are now empty and boarded up, but Charlotte Simpson, pictured in the image, and a few of her neighbours are still there, refusing to budge until they get a fair deal from the corporation. Land clearances in the name of progress. I could have also talked about the growing number of food banks in the city as a counter to the myth of oil as wealth for all who live here. I could have also talked about the economies of sex work as it relates to the economy of oil, but there's not the time. As many oil producing cities, Aberdeen's current position is certainly not post-industrial, but rather sits awkwardly in the grinding persistence of the oil economy. In recent years, so-called post-oil imaginaries have emerged, the development of the cultural industries to drive tourism being one of them. This is played out in an eruption of arts festivals delivered by models of importing culture. This form of short-term consumption culture is something that an oil city is comfortable with. This is not a post-oil imaginary. This is still imagining with the structures of oil. Two, climate change and pedagogy. I was shadow curator alongside my curator colleague, Naoko Mabon, for this project. The curatorial fellowship was run by Peacock Visual Arts in Aberdeen and supported five fellows to develop their practice through a series of workshops with established practitioners. They were then supported to collectively develop and deliver their own public programme at Peacock's. It was called With the North Sea. So essentially, it was an education programme developed in response to the needs of the participants with an artistic outcome at the end. A pedagogical model that is framed in thinking about radical hospitality, described as, quote, handing over the keys to knowledge and allowing the guests to become a kind of host. Peacock Visual Arts, as a long-standing organisation in the city, handed over the keys to a group of young people. They had to learn how to work together, to critically support each other, and to manage the tensions in working in collective settings. I'm interested in this model as it attaches to the wider role of young people in the climate debate that might disrupt the power structures of knowledge and research production. To talk about young people's voices in the climate, climate debate in a meaningful way, we need to talk about relationships to support structures, hospitality and learning.
As a consequence, my question is, can other established institutions, cultural or otherwise, engage in radical hospitality? Is this already happening? And if so, who's doing it? Thank you. Thank you very much to all our speakers. Um, so to Lahong Nagok, to Alison Hendry, Christy Drutman, Holly Gillibrand, and Rachel Grant. Um, if we were uh, in the same place, there'd be a big round of applause now. So I'd like all our speakers just to imagine that big round of applause from over a hundred people in the room. <laughs> so before we go on to the live Q and A, I would like now to introduce our respondent to those presentations. This is uh, Professor Colin Campbell, himself a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and chief executive of the James Hutton Institute. I'm going to embarrass him with the usual short biography. So uh, make yourself comfortable, Colin. Colin has a broad interest in sustainable development and has developed the vision and mission of the James Hutton Institute around the UN Sustainable Development Goals. He sits on the Scottish Government's Forum for Natural Capital. He served on the Royal Society of Edinburgh's Commission of Inquiry Facing Up to Climate Change and was a contributing author to the UK National Ecosystem Assessment. His own research includes studies of the soil biodiversity and the soil microbiome. He is a visiting professor at the Swedish Agricultural Sciences University in Uppsala and also has in-field experience of working in China, Australia and South America. And those of you who had the pleasure of being at the Peter Wilson lecture last year, remember that um, Colin gave up his seat on the panel um, for a young person who asked, how do I get on this panel? And he said, well, take my seat. And so that was the inspiration for this year's event, which we have given over to young people. So with that build up, Colin, I'm going to hand over to you for your seven minutes um, to give your response to these inspiring speakers, um, these young speakers from all over the world. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Sarah. And um, I was wondering why you asked me actually, it's taken me another shot at being on a panel. So thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, my introduction was about me being a scientist, and um, I hope to goodness nobody's expecting me to give you lots of hard science about um, the topic we've just been listening to, because my overarching response was um, actually much more emotional, and um, I was genuinely inspired um, by what I heard. Um, it's not just because of the COVID-19 lockdown, and, um, um, or because of a father, or indeed a grandfather. And um, but I really did take on board what everyone said uh, to heart, and uh, I but and I think there were some incredibly important messages there. Um, and I'd like to congratulate the RSSE, RSE, and SARR for putting on this event. It is imaginative and different and novel, and um, to have such diversity of presentation from different parts of the world, um, from different perspectives, I think is exactly one of the messages that comes from those who have spoken to us here today. And I think Peter Wilson, who I didn't know, but um, I have heard a great deal about, um, was a man of real calibre. And I think he'd be absolutely amazed to see this type of event in his name and in his honour. And um, in many of the aspects he would have identified with, you know, the aspects of um, rural livelihoods, for example, uh, he would recognise straight away in relation to the issues that we have in Scottish agriculture as well. Um, we're, we're never satisfied with the way we manage our land when we're damaging the climate, we're damaging biodiversity and in many cases, not making a decent livelihood for the farmers who manage that land. So I'd like to think Peter would take um, many aspects out of this um, talk. Um, I think the, the thing I'd like to say is that this is a personal view. Um, it's what I've taken from the, the uh, conversations. And, um, but at the same time, um, I do see real power in these messages. And the first one that I was really picking up was the, the power of communication. I think you'll agree everyone did a fantastic job of communicating there. And even the, the aspect of having um, British Sign Language here emphasises that we need to actually communicate in many different languages. It's not just international 
languages, but languages for different abilities and capabilities. And I think that was an important message. But also there was a message there about the power of the story. And, and for me, uh, this is something that I've always found as well. The, the authenticity of real testimony is incredibly powerful. It does, as somebody said, cut through the facts. Um, and this is a very urgent time in which to actually be able to communicate and instill the proper actions in, in people. And this, this authentic storytelling is becoming even more powerful when you start to add to technology such as social media. And, and Christy made that very, very clear. If I could get two and a half hours of anybody's attention in a day, I would be really, really pleased. And uh, the power of social media is something that uh, young people in particular have adopted um, very effectively and is something that we should all learn as a lesson uh, from the youth debate. Um, but it made me think about actually what is the story that young people today would want to tell when they're my age and uh, when they are the older generation. And I would love to hear about that actually. What, do, what would be the story, thinking about this moment in time with COVID-19 in the year 2020, what is the story you would like to hear in the future where things are the way you would want them to be? And that's because storytelling is also fantastic at visioning what the future might be. And that was coming across, I think, from several of the speakers, was actually thinking about a positive future. And storytelling can be one way to actually frame what a positive future we actually want and to get everybody aligned with that positive future. I think one of the other messages that I was taking from um, the, the video um, that we, we just um, watched was the simplicity of truth. Um, as a scientist, um, I often talk about how complex the world is. And I, I've studied climate change as a massive biophysical effect on the world. But clearly, it's something which is caused by people. And it's only people that can actually resolve the, this particular problem. But the simplicity of truth does cut through the complexity sometimes. And it's something I would love to know more about, is it why the young can see the simplicities of truths in a way that, as we get older, we don't. And, um, and again, this is really important because, as I'll come back to near the end, there's a real urgency here. We need to cut through to the truth and to enact people in the right way. The sort of third message I was picking up was really one around diversity. And clearly, there's been a very conscious attempt for this event to, to make sure that we're covering diversity in all sorts of ways, um, place-based perspectives from all around the world, um, perspectives from different ethnicities, um, perspectives from different situations. And diversity isn't just the, the right thing to do. The message I was picking up was that diversity is immensely powerful. That actually having those diversity of perspectives is very powerful in itself in terms of actually finding solutions to things like climate change. And I think the lesson for me there is that we need to be consciously trying to listen to many, many more aspects and perspectives of diverse places, people, and perspectives. I think the, the other aspect of that is that clearly we need to think about that from a science point of view. And um, the Royal Society of Edinburgh was um, formed um, during something known as the Scottish Enlightenment. And uh, during the Scottish Enlightenment, it was a period when philosophers, scientists, uh, artists, poets of all sorts uh, were often in each other's company. And they had very many different perspectives on uh, how the world operated and how society operated. And there were many, many good breakthroughs through that time. But actually, since that time, science in particular has diversified into a huge range of unimaginable different disciplines. And we study all the different aspects of climate change in lots of different ways. But in reality, that discipline base has often hindered us to, in terms of getting a perspective across disciplines. And I think science needs to kind of rediscover the ways of actually connecting the arts, the humanities, the social sciences, the natural sciences to address what are very, very complex um, situations with climate change. So I, again, I took that as a, a, a lesson. And, a, and I think another lesson that I was picking up was about how the younger generation are seeing things in simpler better terms, but also we are perhaps um, needing to think about the intergenerational relationships that we have. Um, from what I've observed of the, the young movements, there are many older generations who are getting 100% behind young people and, and what they want. But equally, there are many who are not, and there are many people in the middle of the two generations who are maybe not as fully engaged. 
So how do we how do we capture all of the um, the power and the diversity of view of all the generations? Um, I think that's something we all need to think a lot more about. The other major um, lesson that I took from this, and um, this is the last one I've got for you, was around reflection. And clearly COVID-19 has enforced us to think uh, quite differently about our futures and about the ways in which we've done things in the past. And several of our speakers talked about this opportunity for reflection. We have to be very, very careful. Uh, COVID-19 may seem like a very immediate and desperately tragic situation and uh, the, the economy may be heavily disrupted for many, many years. But in fact, the opportunity to reflect is a very short one. And yet we have a very urgent need to address things like climate change. So we really do have to make the most of this opportunity for reflection to actually, again, frame what we want in the future and think about the ways in which we actually achieve that future going forward. 10 years ago, I was uh, one of the authors on a report called Fight Facing Up to Climate Change. Uh, this was led by David Sugden. It was a fabulous experience for me as a um, sort of mid-career scientist, and I learned a huge amount. And we made all sorts of recommendations about how we can face up to climate change. I have to say, 10 years later, I'm probably saying the same things. And actually, not a lot has actually happened in those 10 years. And at the time, we thought about science and technology and the way in which that could actually improve climate change. But one of the real strong messages coming from today's presentations is around people. And I still do believe that science and technology has got a place to play in solving the climate change scenario, but only if it actually meets the needs of people and meets the vision that people want for the future. 10 years from here is going to be too late. We have probably a decade in which to make the major changes that are going to set a new course in terms of climate change. So we can't afford to reflect for too long but we do need to take the opportunity to make sure we include the diversity of views that we've seen expressed today and try to envisage a joint future which is bright and positive. So I'll, I'll finish up there. Um, I hasten to add that is again just a personal perspective, but I hope it adds something to the event and uh, allows uh, or provokes people to ask further questions. And thanks for the opportunity. Many thanks, Colin. Really appreciate you taking the time to give your personal response to the presentations from the speakers. For me, it's generated uh, two or three questions, but I won't use that uh, chairperson's right just yet uh, because we have a question that's come in, which I'd like to put to the panel. Um, and the panel can self-select as who would like to respond to this. And then I'll save my, my questions uh, for later. So um, Professor Stuart Munro, himself a, a fellow here, um, has asked the question, um, I take on board the passion of all the speakers I've listened to today, but one thing I've learned from the COVID-19 crisis is that we must be guided by the science. My question, how do you balance passion with scientific evidence? So who would like to answer this? I presume someone from the panel appears magically. Steve, we might need you to help here. Is it that I can't see? So. Sarah, do you want me to have a go first? Just as we yes, I'm sure okay. somebody has indicated they would like to answer. So okay. if Colin, if you go for it, and then Steve, maybe you can um, help find out who from the panel is also wanting to answer. Thank you. Yeah, I, I thought it was a great question. As a scientist, it was one that I, I thought about a lot. In fact, I was going to try and talk about it, and I decided it would be too difficult. Um, and I think that there, there is always a danger that we do go ahead of the, the scientific evidence. I think in relation to climate change, um, we have accumulated a large amount of scientific evidence. And I think there's always a need to try and um, simplify the messages. Um, if, if we had all the time in the world, we could actually spend a lot of time talking about great detail on the scientific evidence, but we need to distill out what are the truisms or the simplicities of truth that actually come from that scientific evidence in order to communicate them when we need great urgency. Now, that, that sounds like maybe a very unscientist thing to say, 
but I do believe that is uh, really, really important. Uh, scientists have great difficulty sometimes distilling the facts as they would might call them themselves. And we always like to put caveats and uncertainties on things. Um, but I think when we're faced with urgency, as with COVID-19 and with climate change, we need to make our, an almost our best guess as to how to actually take this forward. Bearing in mind that we have spent a lot of time distilling the evidence and the scientific facts, we need to trust sometimes our, our, our interpretations perhaps more than we do, and be bolder about what we actually say. Thank you, Colin. Anyone from the panel want to add to that? I'll say something. Um, so I think that there needs to be like a bigger discussion on how climate models are discussed with the public. So like there's a lot of complex aspects of climate models. And if you on, go on Google and you look up a Google image search on like climate models, um, the, the infographics are kind of ugly. Like they're just really complicated. And I don't think the average person really understands like the breakdown of it. And I think that it would be really great for climate scientists to work with the artists and humanities as Colin said, to figure out how they can uh, break down these climate models for like the everyday person to start to understand what they mean and how it would actually like impact their community. So I think it's about taking like complex models, communicating the science and being able to like pull out personal stories related to those climate impacts. So that way people are able to actually like visualize and understand what this is gonna look like in one, three, five, 50 years. So yeah. Rachel, I was wondering um, whether you wanted to comment on this because your presentation talked about bringing evidence into these debates and discussions in your example. You're on mute still. <laughs> we all do it. It's the Zoom world. Okay, you're still on mute. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, just having a moment to myself. Um the yeah, I suppose it's thinking um I think was previously highlighted by Christy, this kind of relationship between arts and humanities and science that um I mean maybe simplifying is the wrong word, but even um you know making it uh interesting I suppose but also the the kind of relationship of um balancing passion with scientific evidence for me the kind of culture of um storytelling and kind of representation is the the witness and the testimony of people that that live the transformations and erasures of, of their land and the place that they live through these, these lived experiences. So it's maybe asking the question about um, how do you, uh, what becomes kind of scientific evidence? Um, can the, you know, does and can the lived experiences of people living with tremendous uh, climate change within their environment become as kind of useful a thing as, as kind of climate change models, et cetera. Thank you. I'll move on to the next question, which has just jumped down my screen, getting used to this. <laughs> um, again, for anyone to volunteer from the panel, does the hope of new technologies in the future actually make people less likely to act now? So is science and innovation actually holding back small individual actions? Any thoughts? Does it relate to the hope point that you were talking about, Holly? You know, people actually might have a hope for future technologies to be solving things so they may hold off um, doing anything now because they believe in a technological solution in the future. Um, I think you do definitely get people who just use the idea of future technologies as an excuse not to act now and it, it and politicians definitely do that a lot and they say that we don't need to do this because 
in 20 years we'll have these technologies that will suck carbon out of the air. And this is quite, this is a very dangerous way of thinking because that is holding off the action, the emissions reductions that we need now. And so, but I think politicians are more likely to put their hope in future to technologies than um, individuals than citizens. That's my that's been my experience anyway. And I think people are willing to make the changes. And we've seen with coronavirus that people do want um, the climate and ecological crisis to be treated seriously. And I, they understand that we need to use the technologies that we have right now, trains and simple things like that, that can that will make the difference. And so, yes, we need to stop putting people, like giving people hope in future technologies. They may exist and that would, that would be great if they did exist in 20 years time, but we can't like use them as the magic pill that will solve everything and we, can ju we just need to wait until then. Thank you. Um, so another question, what process does the panel think should be used for decision-making? i.e. how could we or should we decide what to do next? These are tough questions. <laughs> Nobody's giving you an easy ride. Christy, are you, are you wanting to say something? No? So do we all think decision-making is, is fine right now, or do we have ideas on how things should be decided in the future? Colin. As I said, yeah, I've been trying to stay out of this to a large extent, but um, this, this question came up during the Facing Up to Climate Change inquiry 10 years ago as well. And, um, there was some great um, uh, work done by John Webb looking at the role of society in actually uh, helping to make decisions. And I mean, clearly we have a, a, a we have a process and a um, in place for making decisions in society, but uh, we all complain they never come to the right decisions. And it's all linked with the evidence base and how we use evidence. Um, but I think one of the things we picked up from facing up to climate change inquiry was around um, interventions by by society and by government. Uh, we often are very reluctant to intervene, even when we know interventions actually would make a difference. And um, sort of comparisons were made with um, seat belts in cars, um, smoking bans, etc. You know, when uh, we intervene in these things, we have proven benefits. But when you compare that with the resistance to actually doing that kind of thing, it, it, it's a real struggle. Uh, and we seem to be reluctant sometimes to actually intervene and, and for society and government to actually make interventions that that all the scientific evidence says would work. Um, and I think we're, we're often too too shy about that in, in these types of interventions. Um, in mm. Thanks, Colin. Anyone else want to add to that? No, okay. Oh, yes, Alison. Just to make sure you can hear me. Alison saying, I think it's really important to make sure that there's consultation with people, you know, and for example, deaf people, BSL users like myself, like I said in my presentation, you know, English isn't always a first language for us. And so you need to have that consultation with people in their first language and find out what they want to see, you know, and this is something that for years, you know, deaf people have had other people making their decisions for them. And so I think we really need that opportunity to have our voices, you know, finally heard and our opinions and our decisions listened to um, in terms of any future decision making. Because, you know, on deafness and BSL issues, we're the experts in our own lives. And yet, you know, for years we've been spoken for. And so we're not even there yet in terms of full inclusivity. And so... I would say that in terms of decision-making processes, there needs to be a lot more consultation with relevant communities. Thanks very much, Alison. Thank you. And I think what you've just said there echoes um, some of what was in your um, contribution, Christy, about uh, different groups who are typically marginalised from decision-making processes. 
I can see you nodding, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. Would you agree with that or, or not? Yeah, I would definitely agree with that statement. And yeah, I mean, I was considering answering this, but uh, yeah, I would say that a big thing is just like to develop more active listening. I think that there's a lot of just people making decisions, but not thinking about who's left out of those conversations. So I think that, you know, having local listening sessions, obviously it's harder with like COVID and quarantine, but I think that there needs to be just like more community conversations, like local town halls, um, things like that, where people are actually like sitting down and understanding what are the issues and needs of a community and how does that relate to climate resilience and adaptation? Because those are the things that communities really need to start taking seriously uh, that they actually can have control over is figuring out what is their community actually doing to figure out how to be resilient in future climate crises. Uh, in disaster response and things like that. And I think COVID is really revealing how vulnerable and how weak and fragile a lot of the, that systematic planning has been. And so I think that that's something that the average everyday person can start looking into and taking action on. Great, thank you, Christy. Okay, the next question um, is from Mark Huxham. None of us can tackle climate change on our own and sometimes feeling responsible can be overwhelming. I speak with many people suffering from eco-anxiety and mental health problems linked with this. So how important does the panel think is individual action? And is there a danger of making people depressed and anxious? What do people think about that? Holly, I'm going to put you on the spot as, a, as an activist and someone who is doing individual action and probably you know and are networked with others who are acting at an individual level. What's your feeling about this, this particular question? Um, well, it depends what he means by like individual action, action as in like striking and other protesting or um, consumer change. So like going vegan or stopping flying. But I think Taking individual action in either form does the opposite. It really gives you hope and it makes you feel like you're making a difference. So I think individual change obviously won't make a difference, but if you do it with lots of people, then it will. And when it comes to consumer change, individual consumer change, I think we need both. So we need both consumer change and societal change, but people like to say that individual change doesn't matter. I think it does, but only because we need both. We need both individual change and societal change. And the changes you make as a consumer and as an individual also send a message to other people that this is serious and you're willing to change for it. So it's yes, it slightly reduces your carbon footprint, but more importantly, it sends a message to other people. So individual change is like if you, if you have eco anxiety, I reckon it's probably one of the best things you can do because it really does make, yeah, it makes you feel like you are making a difference. And, and yeah, it's just, it's also just morally important that you do do whatever you can. Thank you very much, Holly. Anyone else want to come in on that one? Yeah, Alison. There we go. Hi everyone. Yeah, what Holly said, actually, I agree with that. Um, I do think um, individuals can impact the bigger society. My own view is, as a deaf person, I do find it difficult to, to get involved in following that way because I don't think there's really an example out there. I mean, there, there could well be someone, but I don't know, I haven't met them, I haven't seen them, and they're not visible in any way. So I guess... Um, I suppose that's why there's only limited information available in BSL because we don't have that, that figurehead out there. So if there was access to more information for BSL users, I would think that you'd see much more activism within the deaf community on this topic. So we need to go back, I think, to, and have that conversation about access to that information for these groups so that they can you know, acquire that information 
um, because they may be quite reluctant at the moment because there's only you know a few people but you only need a few people to start that process and to get on board and maybe that group of young people would come along together the deaf community are certainly um, powerful and they feel empowered once they have that information and they're very supportive of each other so I think it is actually who guides it, who takes the lead on that. And I think we need more visibility within the deaf community, the, the sign language speaking community. So it might be that, that we need to identify those people and give them the tools so that they can become the leaders of the future. Great, and that leads us on, Alison, really nicely to our next question um, from Kate Smith. How can we ensure that we really are including a diverse range of young people in the conversation? What about people who are socially and economically excluded? How do we make sure we include them in the conversation? Alison, you may want to continue, Holly or Christy or Rachel. Anyone want to come in on that? Christy, to me, that's what a lot of your work is about, really. Yeah, I, yeah, I would love to speak on this. I would say that a really important way to include people that uh, don't come from as economically or socially privileged positions is again, to figure out ways that people can save money by like going more eco-friendly and by figuring out how are more environmentally friendly initiatives going to save their communities money. And I think that there has been a lot of research uh, by analysts from around the world that are showing that a lot of the technologies and policies to try to create more eco-friendly solutions can actually save people more money. And I think that there's a disconnect uh, where people are like, that's going to be so expensive to be able to like go green. And in some situations, yes, that could be happening, but there's a lot of other situations where it could actually end up saving people more money and can actually like support their well being in the long term. And I think that a lot of policymakers and scientists are not really great at communicating that. And I think that there are some people like bloggers and now like, sustainability people on the internet that are starting to spread that message. But I think that it's still like disconnected from people's everyday experience. So I would say like trying to break down how are things like a plant-based diet, living more sustainably and like environmental technologies, how is that going to benefit a person's individual community is the most important way to include them in that conversation. Anything from anyone else on that one? No, that moves us on to a next question um, from Alan Smith, who says there's been a lot of talk about the youth voice being listened to, which is very important. Um, but what do we do to move from advocacy to action? What ideas do the panel have for practical activity for young people? So moving from this really important element of young people being listened to, which is the whole point of this debate today, and saying, well, how do we move uh, from that to action and, and what ideas uh, do you have on the panel for that? Who would like to come in? Moving from talking to actually making a difference, which is, I think, from your presentations, what you really want to be about. I'll start and other people can join in. I would just say like a big thing is definitely um, writing to, I, this is in the US context. I don't know how it works in the UK, um, but definitely just like writing letters to your politicians, um, definitely letting them know that like your concerns about uh, whether or not like your community or your state is actually taking climate action seriously especially in communities where there's pipelines or fossil fuel infrastructure that's like poisoning people's like 
water and air and land, uh, definitely signing petitions. There's lots of local grassroots organizations that have been working on this for decades. Um, I at least know here in the US, um, grassroots organizations that aren't receiving as much support or grassroots funding, et cetera, who really would love volunteers or people to support their battles. So I would say don't reinvent the wheel. Don't go and create your own organization. Try to support the efforts and do some research on what already exists and like amplify their work and try to get try to build movements with people who have already be, been doing it rather than trying to like start your own thing uh, is my biggest advice is doing a quick Google search on what your community is doing to deal with these issues um, and supporting those efforts as often as possible. Thanks, Christy. Uh, Holly, do you want to come in? Um, yeah, so I basically encourage everyone to join the school strikes or, and other youth-based movements such as um, Youth for Nature and, yeah, just other groups of young people who are, um, like, joining together and trying to make a difference for the environment and for the climate. And I'd also recommend you don't take, indiv like, individual individual action such as like as um Kirsty said starting your own thing or like doing something by yourself because how we are going to make a difference is by joining together and um being part of the movement and I'd also think we not only need to focus on how young people can make more of a difference but how adults can support them because young people have all, all, all of this on their shoulders and adults are just um, us. Well, you, of course, you have some adults that are doing lots of work, and that's brilliant. But many, many adults are just saying that we're doing brilliant jobs, a brilliant job, but they're not actually joining us or supporting us in any productive way. So I think yes, it should not be. It shouldn't be about what young people can do, but what we all can do. Thank you very much, Holly. Rachel, is there anything specific? that you've learned from your work in Aberdeen around this? Yeah, I think it would, um, it would just be to support um, Holly and Christy's experience really that um, trying to start something on your own, particularly in a, uh, a city like Aberdeen that is based on an oil economy um, is super difficult. So the practical stuff of having a look around, um, again, this kind of intergenerational thing that Colin mentioned um, and earlier and Holly's just mentioned again, the intergenerational element. So part of those kind of um, practical stuff for young people might actually be engaging you know in in a group locally that um is not necessarily specifically for young people but might have this kind of intergenerational approach to it as well um so i'm just trying to go back to the question that's disappeared from my screen um so I'll try and remember it. So I don't have the name of the person, sorry. Uh, you know who you are. It was along the lines of, and this might be for you, Rachel, in the first instance, but as we um, move and adapt uh, to the imperatives of climate change, how do we make sure that those working in um, intensive primary sectors, such as oil and gas, and also in agriculture and aquaculture are not rapidly disadvantaged so you've talked about a post oil and gas uh, era but how do we how do we make sure in that transition those uh, people working in those industries uh, are not rapidly disadvantaged sorry I'm having to do that from memory because I can't find it <laughs> thanks Um, so I think that was a question from Leslie uh, Mabon because I spotted it um, earlier. Um, so yes, the kind of, I suppose that's the ideas um, outlined in policy approaches to the just transition. Um, 
and ensuring that I suppose a previous legacy of um, steel industry, coal industry in the UK context um, and lessons learned from um, the kind of dismantling that and how it affected workers and um, subsequently the communities. Um, so I suppose, uh, how does the panel? Not leaving workers behind. I suppose, um, I think there has been qu uh, quite a few approaches so far to the ideas of, of reskilling into the renewable sector. Um, I mean, a lot of the workers in oil and gas are um, highly skilled and do, those skills can be uh, transferred. Um, I suppose it, it comes back to maybe a process of consultation as well, which we talked about earlier in terms of in the context of young people, right? But in, this, in the same uh, consultation process, um, the idea of um, having active workers in extractive industries as part of that is just as important as, as young people. There isn't a kind of like uh, yay or nay over, over different um, sectors. So it's just a couple of things maybe. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Rachel. Um, a couple of teachers have uh, asked a similar question of how they can provide more support um, to those in schools who are wanting to raise this uh, as an environmental issue to, to really put climate change on the agenda. Um, Holly, I guess this question comes mostly to you, but others may want to chip in. What can teachers do? What more can teachers do to support yourself and others like you who are wanting to continue this work? Um, I think basically communicating the science of climate change and also making it more personal for young people because as I said before facts do not engage people as I experienced in school when we learned about climate change people don't care um, we need to make it more personal for them and yeah just talk about the threats we face and the actual science of climate and ecological breakdown and I also understand that it's difficult within the curriculum to to change what you teach and to make it more relevant. So that also moves on to that we need the we don't just need system change, we need um, change within the school system. Because right now subjects like um, the living world and the climate crisis are not being taught as they should. It's being made a minor subject when in fact it is a, the biggest crisis humanity has ever faced. And yeah, we just need to change everything, everything. We just need to change the way we teach about these issues. Because when, when we taught, when we learned about it in geography, it was all about graphs and um, like ice, ice ages, as ice ages and um, sea level rising when and it's got a very narrow view of the issue. It doesn't talk about the societal impacts of it and all the other impacts of climate change, not just sea level rise, which is quite a slow impact. So it will be impacting people um, a few decades from now. And we're not talking about the immediate effects of climate change and how it will affect people and my generation. And so, yeah, we just need to change like the way we teach about it and um, that would be one of the best ways that teachers can support the climate strikers because teachers have a enormous opportunity and the power to change people's mindsets and to teach people about these issues. Anybody else want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I would just like to say that like there's a lot of uh, kids, uh, even kids in the UK that are people of color that like have made posts that like they've had difficulties like participating in climate strikes uh, because their schools don't allow them to or don't like discourage it. And for a lot of these kids, like that's their only ability to be able to advance in society. And so I think that a lot of teachers could be 
more mindful on their students' needs when it comes to um, participating in the climate strikes and being more encouraging if like that is going to like be supportive of them instead of like berating them or punishing them. Um, so I think a lot of teachers could be more open-minded about uh, students participating in activism and trying to encourage and check in with students if like they're feeling comfortable or okay or safe to participate in things like that. Um, and then on like a more micro level, I think uh, teachers could make their classrooms more sustainable to just create more conversations around sustainability, like composting, little environmental facts, like make it just like integrated into the way that you're talking about these things. So that way students, it's not like you have to like do all this extra work to embed in the curriculum, but it's just like a part of the culture of the environment you're creating in your classroom. Great, thanks, Christy. Uh, we have time for one last question before I round up. And this is from an anonymous attendee. Young people are as diverse as any other group. Some are very high consumers. So how do we reach them? So one idea probably from each person is all we have time for. Um, how do we reach the high consumers amongst young people? Who would like to pitch in first? I can just go. <laughs> Because I have a lot of thoughts about this. I think that um, for high consumers, a big thing is the sustainable fashion world. So there's like groups like Fashion Revolution um, and lots of people don't think the fashion industry is like a really polluting industry, but it's one of the top in the world. And that's a really good uh, talking piece that gets a lot of young people, especially young uh, women who are really passionate about fashion to start thinking about how their consumer choices are impacting the environment. So I think that um, for high consumers, it's about figuring out that they actually do have the power to call out corporations for their unsustainable environmental practices and to demand that if they're gonna give these companies their money, that these companies need to change because the consumers, especially this generation, aren't going to put up with it. Okay, thanks, Christy. Anyone else want to come in on that? Alison? I think it's, um, oh, it's just moved. It's kind of hard to answer, but from, you know, a personal view, um, I'm trying to imagine, you know, for example, if I'm talking about myself, you know, years ago when I was a young, you know, younger, if you'd said to me it was, um, you know, unsustainable fashion, I don't think I'd have taken it in because, again, it's the access to the information that I wouldn't have had. And so how am I supposed to know what I'm doing is wrong or that it's having an impact? you know, before I even consider my spending. And so I think we need more awareness and we need to have clear visual examples, you know, and I think it's fair enough talking about the information that people need to get and the facts and figures, but I think when you give people examples, then they can connect with that. You know, if you do X, then it affects Y and really clear information is key. Thanks very much, Alison. Colin, I think you indicated you wanted to come in on this one. Is that right? Yeah, and I think it's, um, I mean, I spend most of my time speaking to adults and usually quite well-informed adults, but I, I do like to use stories and also provocative facts sometimes. And um, the, there's, a, there's a related question about telling a story about consumerism as well. And I think I don't have the answer to that in terms of a really good story about consumerism, but it is about being clear that consumerism and overconsumption is the is the crux of the matter in terms of climate change. And one of the facts that I often use, which does surprise people, is that there are more obese and overweight people in the world than there are starving people. And what that can do is appeal to people's sense of fairness and uh, that we actually do produce enough food in the world, but we don't share it equally. Now, I know it's a very complicated story and there are many nuances and uh, complexities in that, but it is a simple um fact that you know we actually do produce enough food to feed the world but there are many many people who are starving in the world and a lot of people still don't appreciate that and that actually it's overconsumption that is the issue thanks colin so are you are you saying that by communicating that that's a way to involve others who perhaps wouldn't be motivated Yeah, I think it's something we don't ever think about from our own perspective. We, we always see things from our own um, self-aware perspective. 
Um, but, you know, by looking at things at a much more global perspective and comparing and contrasting with people uh, and appealing to people's fairness, um, I think is, is quite tractable for a way of doing it, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Well, that's come to the end of our live Q&A um, because we're, we're due to finish at five. I should just say that our speaker from Viet the Vietnam Academy of Social Sciences and all our speakers here have agreed to take um, any further questions, including those we haven't been able to get to here today by email. So those of you who submitted questions here and you have two or three more minutes to submit before the uh, session ends, those questions will be sent to the panelists and they, they have agreed to respond, uh, which is great. So thank you for all the questions that have come in. And it's now over to me to give a vote of thanks and some closing remarks. I won't, um, as is usual, give a, a big vote of thanks with a summary of the whole discussion because Colin's uh, response was very thorough in that regard. But I, I do want to thank, obviously, all our speakers. So Lohong Hong Gok from uh, Vietnam, Alison sitting in front of us here from the University of Edinburgh, Christy Drutman from, I think you're over in California right now. Is that correct? Yes, thank you. Uh, Brown Girl Green, Holly Gillibrand um, from an, in Northwest Scotland just now. Is that right? Around Loch Gilpad, did I get that right? Yep. And Rachel Grant, uh, freelance curator of Fertile Ground up in Aberdeen. So many thanks indeed for your contributions. And I'd also like to thank Jill and Yvonne for uh, their hard work as interpreters this afternoon, appreciated by uh, Alison and all of us. Thank you so much. Um, and I very much want to thank the audience as well for taking part and for your questions. And uh, of course, again, right at the beginning, uh, we said this is the Peter Wilson lecture and David, his son is here. So we'd like to thank um, the Wilson family for this uh, lecture that happens each year. Um, I'd also like to reiterate uh, our thanks to Rebecca Widderfield as chief executive of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, who very much wanted to be here and was, has been so supportive of this year's event as she is each year. Um, and the, uh, the trustees of the Scottish Consortium for Rural Research as well for this once again successful joint event. And again, just those behind the scenes, Steve and Nazia, for pulling this together and supporting us technically, uh, and particularly myself, through this uh, Zoom webinar. So before I close, there are um, two surveys. One will come immediately to you. Um, it'll pop up on the screen after the event and we'd appreciate it if you could complete it. And then tomorrow, another survey will pop to you. There's no such thing as a free Zoom webinar. You will get a survey. Um, it's about what next, really. So uh, one of the questions that popped up was if the first minister was in the room, um, what would you want to say to her about what should happen next? So you will, in the four questions that have been developed in partnership with the Royal Scottish Geographical Society, James Hutton Institute, Scottish Natural Heritage, Young Scott and Scottish Enterprise, you will get your chance to say who should do what next. It's about one of the questions that came up moving from, from talk to action. So this is your opportunity tomorrow to get those thoughts worrying um, of who should do what next and send your answers in um, to those questions, please. So thanks again to everyone and uh, stay safe and um, let's keep this conversation going. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.